to our afternoon edition of, or evening, I guess, depending where you are, of the podcast. Hello, hello, hello. This is season two, episode four. Jacob's here. Yep. Imagine that. Today's a good day. Yeah. 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 I mean, do you care to share why it's a good day or? <laughs> well, it's a variety of things, but primarily today's a good day because we won a battle with PayPal. <laughs> yeah. So I figured that was part yeah. of it being a good day. When you have many thousands of dollars tied up in a PayPal account that's locked, that's concerning. Yeah. Yep. So we came out positive there. So I, for one, that's a testament to PayPal. Uh, in some ways, what they did is completely crazy, ridiculous, stupid. But at least they did restore the account to full functionality and put it back as if it had never happened. But anyway, yeah, the details are yeah neither here nor there for this conversation. But uh, yeah, it was a good day to get access to a bunch <clears throat> of funds we haven't been able to touch in a week plus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, good day. Hey, uh, Chad and Curtis, Teresa, you know Sam. I'm sorry, Riley. I, I'll just say this. Oh. If you're listening to this right now, because this this is just us and a couple of people on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, stop using PayPal. <laughs> if you like the Second Amendment, if you care about your privacy at all, I will ask you to consider stop using PayPal. People like PayPal because it you don't have to give your credit card to random websites where you want to buy things. And so there's something to be said about the security of that transaction. But you need to understand that PayPal knows everything you buy with PayPal. When you when you go to a website and you buy something with a Visa or a MasterCard, uh, Visa and MasterCard, Capital One or Chase or whatever credit card company you're using, they don't know what you bought. They know where you bought it, but they don't know what you bought. But when you pay using PayPal, they know what you bought. They know the actual products you purchase. So there's a privacy concern, number one. And number two, I assure you, they support the Second Amendment less consistently and less than most other merchant providers. So if you care about your privacy and you care about the Second Amendment, you should stop using PayPal. So devil's advocate, fair question to ask. Why do we allow PayPal to be used on our site? Should we take a stand? Because not enough of the 2A community knows what I just said. <laughs> uh, we, we've run tests and our conversion rate on people checking out on our website drops by 10% when we remove PayPal. So if I could get the gun community at large or just the <clears throat> world at large to recognize the dangers of using PayPal, and then it was kind of minimized as a, as a business risk, we would stop accepting it. So in other words, we like your money and we are greedy capitalists. To some degree, that's absolutely true. <laughs> it would cost us tens of thousand dollars a year of revenue that we can't spare to not accept PayPal. People... But on our website, if you click on PayPal, you now see a message that says, yes, we accept PayPal, but please don't use it. This is why. I like that. I like that. Cool. Cool. Well, anyway. Um, all right. Today's episode, guys, by the way, we're going to talk about not PayPal stuff. No. <laughs> Sorry, we got off on that tangent. Not our topic, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're going to be talking about four rules. I think Jacob refers to it as four rules of holsters. I To me, that sounds strange. So I call it four rules for holsters. Um, but it doesn't really matter, I suppose, semantics being what they are. Um, but we're going to talk about holsters and how to choose a good quality holster pretty much what it comes down to i mean and that's also safe like safety is paramount right so uh yeah that's today's topic today's episode we're glad to have you all with us a bunch of you watching us on facebook this afternoon evening only one of you on youtube that's okay we'll take you too we love you I, i'm sure there'll be a few more uh it's usually the case there's usually a few more that come in a little bit later um yes that is correct bob that paypal refuses many firearms related transactions in fact they don't, if it's specifically firearms, they don't handle that at all. <laughs> that's immediately, yeah, that's a, that's a full stop. <laughs> yep. Ammunition? No. And that's actually what got us in trouble was uh, they flagged a transaction where somebody bought dummy ammunition through our site. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yep. And Jacob tried to fight that battle, but they're like, no, we still consider that a against our policy. Can't can't sell dummy ammunition. That's completely in there. And not only that, promotes safety. 
in dry fire practice with a gun. Anyway. Well, let's get into the recorded portion of the show. Uh, guys, again, again, thanks for watching. And uh, we'll be talking about holsters today. So any questions, whatnot you have, feel free to ask in the comments here today. Beginning the recorded portion of the show in three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, Season 2, Episode 4. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network, brought to you by our new title sponsor, XS Sites. Today is Wednesday, May 12th, 2021, and I am your host, Riley Bowman, joined today by Jacob Paulson. Glad to be here. Nothing fancy to say about you. We're just glad you're here. Nothing. Not, I'm good. <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe that May is like almost halfway over because that means we're almost to June. And uh, June brings my birthday. And then it gets us really close to Independence Day. And those are all very happy days for me. <laughs> I'm glad to be alive and I'm glad to be an American. <laughs> Preach it. <laughs> Guys, welcome to the podcast. Today's episode, uh, we are going to be talking about four rules for holsters uh, and probably a few other things along the way. We're basically, we're talking about holsters and how to choose. What, what are some guiding principles for choosing the right holster for you that not only will enhance your ability to respond to a threat, but also carry that gun and do it in a manner that's safe? Because that is important. So uh, I look forward to getting into it with you. But first, today's episode sponsors. We have the Ready Up Gear Laser Dot Trainer, which is a laser cartridge for dry fire use. Uh, Ready Up Gear uh, has brought these to market, and you know what? It's a it's a great. In fact, I thought I had one sitting around here somewhere. I don't know where it went, but I use these quite a bit. You'll see me use them in the Shooter Ready Challenge that we do once a month uh, quite often because they work great with software like laser X or LASRX uh, for dry fire practice and tracking hits on target along with shot times. <clears throat> but the uh, ready up gear laser dot trainer, very reasonable price, high quality product. And um, yeah, you should have one because at the very basic level, if you don't want to spend you know, a little bit of money and have a big, old, a big long wait for one of these cert pistols that I like I'm holding up here, uh, which are back order right now at the very base level, you can get into dry fire training with software integration with a radio gear laser dot trainer. And so well, all you got to do is use go. it with your real gun in your holster. Right. That's right. So all you got to do is go to readyupgear.com, find the laser dot trainer there on the site, pick one up. We hope that you'll enjoy. Uh, of course, you can do dry fire training without software, without lasers, without cert pistols. Uh, and you could do a lot of effective dry fire training that way. But I like enhancing my dry fire practice with being able to combine it with data collection because then that actually gives me actionable information to inform my dry fire practice to help me get better faster. So now the other sponsor of today's episode is the uh, Range Tech Shot Timer. You can find them at rangetechtimer.com. Uh, yeah, huge fan of Range Tech Shot Timers. Obviously, we make them. Many of you know that. Um, but it's an awesome product, and we are uh, thrilled to see that they sell as well as they do, uh, that we're constantly churning and trying to you know keep up with and i think we do a pretty good job with that like you, you place an order for range tech shot timer they usually get shipped pretty quickly as opposed yeah. to some we're others out we're, there on the market we're barely staying in stock at any given time but we we are <laughs> pulling it off <laughs> yeah so and you know and and i'll tell you one of the big big reasons i like the range tech shot timer so much is it, it actually it it makes my practice sessions at the range a lot more efficient uh, because I don't have to feel like I, I, I don't feel like I have to record stuff quite as uh, quite as often at the very least, if I'm still like writing down notes in like a shooting journal of sorts or a notebook where I like to keep track of things um, I'll run 
numerous drills and things and the shot timer screen, which is your app on your, like your, your mobile phone or tablet device. Like it just keeps those times in there indefinitely. So I can scroll up and see everything all at once right within the application. And then of course, if I want to, I can also save them in the online cloud uh, uh, storage. If you want to save your data right within range tech as well, you have that option. So, but I like, I, I love, you know, it's, it's really cool when I, I'll do like a drill and film it and put it on video and maybe it's multiple strings of fire and I can get done and, and show the camera or show people like, here's that one, here's that one, here's that one. And it's just really cool. It's all right there on the display and intuitive to use as opposed to old school shot timers where you run it and then the next time you hit the button, that data is typically gone. So anyway, su super huge fan of the range tech shot timers. And so we appreciate you guys' support of uh, our sponsors, which support us and the Concealed Carry podcast. It wouldn't be possible without, uh, well, if, if there was not money coming in paying for our jobs, then uh, we wouldn't be able to, to this podcast like we do it's not complicated <laughs> all right guys so let's get into the meat of today's episode told you that this is four rules for holsters um i don't know how do you want to kick this one off jacob where do you want to go with it <clears throat> well I, th I think that the the premise of the concept here is understanding that it's it becomes impossible in today's marketplace to uh, create a list of holsters that we think are good or bad there's too many holster companies out there. There's too many holsters being made. Even one given holster company might have one product that's really good and one that maybe we don't think is as good, or they might have a holster that is good for carrying a certain position, but not another. And, and so it, it, it feels very overwhelming. You know, when we field a lot of questions from people about holsters, generally speaking, uh, whether that's you know, podcast listeners or potential customers on our website or students in our classroom. And so it becomes more prudent to create a list of just criteria and say, hey, here, here's the rules. Here's the criteria. Go buy whatever or shop for whatever holster and just make sure it meets these rules as a minimum criteria. This mm -hmm. is how we create a minimum standard that can be applied against any product. I would say that being principle-based uh, or focused with things is always a better play than because that's that helps us as long as the principles are sound that helps us avoid, you know, dogma and, um, you know, just in like institutionalized retardery. Sorry if I use a politically incorrect term, but you know, where it's just like, you know, you ask someone, well, why do you do something a certain way? Well, this is just the way we've done it forever. You know, it's like, well, okay, there's gotta be a, a deeper level of thought to that or a reason why we do the things we do. And I'm really big about understanding why we do what we do. And so uh, you're exactly right that there's a gazillion companies out there that make holsters and there is, it is tough to be like, okay, these are the good ones and we put them on a list and these are the bad ones and we put them on this other list. Like that would be unwieldy to even try to keep track of such a list. I certainly do have kind of like my top five or six companies that, you know, just because from experience, I know they make a quality product. And I know that those products meet what we're going to discuss today as far as principles. But that's what this episode is meant to focus on is what are the principles, if you will, behind what makes a quality holster. And specifically, we refer to these as four rules for holsters because I really do feel like these are these are absolute essential uh, features of, of a holster because in many cases, these so-called rules are what's going to keep you safe. As yeah, minimum to. standards. Exactly. As far as, you know, keep, you, you're talking about carrying a gun on your person. That's a, that's serious business. And people every year in this country, way too many times, um, you know, way more than we can keep track of or count <laughs> Shakespeare. That's funny. Uh, there's way more times than we can uh, keep track of that people shoot themselves accidentally and negligently in many cases because they're not using appropriate safety gear essentially as it relates to how they're carrying the gun you know i just read a story the other day jacob of uh a man that was um using a shoulder holster and we've talked about shoulder holsters a little bit and they they if you are not careful if you're not careful they can get you in trouble like they there's some potential safety issues that relates to shoulder holsters one of the four rules for holsters we're going to talk about today 
deals with this specifically, but one of the challenges with a shoulder holster or one of the things that it absolutely must have, if you're going to use one, and I honestly don't see much point to one, but some people do because they want to feel like they're reliving the glory days of Miami Vice. But um, if you're going to use a shoulder holster, then that holster's ability to retain the gun in the holster is, that is like, so critical because most of the accidents I've seen or heard of um, regarding shoulder holsters are where guns fall out of the holster. And the, the, the story I read the other day was very similar to one we covered on the podcast a year or two ago where a dad shot himself and died in the stomach or ab- abdominal region because he was bending over inside his vehicle to secure his child in their car, in their car seat. And his gun started falling out of his shoulder holster, and he went to to grab it, to try to catch it. And in the process, finger or thumb, probably thumb, grabbed the trigger because it would probably been backwards and shot himself right in the stomach, and he died. Like that, I remember the first time we covered that story in the podcast, and like, it still hurts me to think about that because here you got a father, do, you know, being a good father, taking care of his child, buckling them up in a car seat, you know, just doing the dad thing. And next thing you know, he's dead because he made a poor choice in holster. So that's how serious this is. It's a big deal. And I, for me, these rules are crafted in order of priority. I'll, I'll add that as well. That the, the order of this is not random. Uh, I, it, for me, you know, me and Riley may not see everything eye to eye on this, but for me, these rules are in order. Like from most important to least important. But all four are you know minimum standards. Well, let's hear it then. Let's hear n- rule number one. I'm pretty sure that we pretty well align on this, but let's hear number one. Rule number one, the holster must fully cover the trigger guard in such a way so as to make the depression of the trigger impossible while the gun's in the holster. Yes. So there's two parts of that, and, and we'll need to add some clarifying points. But the first part is that the holster must fully cover the trigger guard. So fully cover the trigger guard is important because we definitely do see holsters that don't fully cover the trigger guard. Right, where just a, a bit of the trigger guard is, is left exposed. And you can decide for yourself how you know how concerning that is. But if if the trigger guard's exposed to a degree that uh, I can take my pocket knife, slip it into the holster, and actuate the trigger without removing the gun from the holster, then I call that a serious deal breaker. So we eliminate that potential problem or we eliminate any gray area by just saying the trigger guard is fully covered. I agree with that. Absolutely. Because we have seen some holster designs over the years where probably like the spirit of the law is met as far as like the trigger guard and trigger is probably adequately covered, but there's still like a little opening that the trigger guard is exposed And I've seen companies try to even justify that, you know, well, you know, the trigger is set forward of that, you know, it, 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 yes, there's a little exposure, but there's really not, not anything that can get in there and, you know, get access to the trigger. And it's like, why are we justifying that? Like if, because it becomes a gray area, it's like, well, if this much of trigger guard exposure is okay, then is that much? Okay. Is that much? Okay. And where do we draw the line? And, you know, obviously companies have to be responsible for themselves and design and manufacture products that as best as, you know, like it's on them. It, it's the, the responsibility is on them to make products that are safe. Uh, yeah, and, and, and in addition to. Let's just make it, I guess my point is, let's just make it black and white. Cover the trigger yeah. guard and then we're done. <clears throat> yeah, this is part like the, you know, imagine in your, in your, in your mind, you know, visualize a gun in a holster. Uh, and, and probably the gun is vertical with the, with the muzzle pointing downward. Okay. So with that visual in mind, like this, the, when we say must fully cover the trigger guard so as to make the depression of the trigger uh, impossible, the, the first part of this co- fully cover the trigger guard means that vertically on the gun, the, the material of the holster is going up completely to cover the trigger guard. But then we add that other piece of this so as to make it impossible for the trigger to be depressed while in the holster. Well, there's 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 two issues here, and I'm gonna the one I'm gonna focus on right now is the the horizontal space on either side of the trigger guard in, within the holster. 
sometimes we'll see I'll see materials, uh, you know, a leather holster or something. And, and this often, by the way, this often is an issue when when the company makes a holster that's meant to be a one size fits all, right? So or, or a one size fits many. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, this holster fits these twelve different models of gun. Sometimes that's done well. Sometimes it's done marginal. I'd say that's most com most common. And sometimes it's done outright poorly. But that's generally a red flag because the, because of this kind of level of detail. It, not only do we have to fully cover the trigger guard vertically, you know, the whole area of the trigger guard, but we also have to not allow enough in any space on either side of the trigger guard. If I can stick my pinky finger into the holster along the trigger guard and fit it in there, that's a problem. Because then while the trigger guard is fully covered, um, it's it's still exposed to the degree that something can slide into the material, into the holster, along with the gun. So that's the other part of this, yep. at least the second part. Yeah, that is um, – you're absolutely right about that. And I'll tell you one place that we do see I, – I see anyway. In fact, something just came up not that long ago from a company uh, marketing a light-bearing uh, holster, meaning that – you know, it's designed for a gun that has a rail-mounted uh, weapon light. And uh, there, there's – your big companies are experienced enough and knowledgeable enough to generally not make mistakes in this regard. But I see more of some of your smaller custom shops that maybe they just aren't as, as experienced in this regard. And so uh, – and what that is – and I'm, I'm going to hold up an example of one here. Just, just use it as an example and what we're talking about here as far as covering and protecting that trigger guard. Doing so on light-bearing holsters is really challenging because you have to have this big opening for that light to actually pass through. But that Channel. opening is in line with where your trigger is. And so on this particular holster, now those that are listening to the audio only, like I'm, I'm holding up a, a Filster floodlight. If you want to know, you can go pull up a picture of one and look at it for yourself and compare it. Um, and and you, you should be able to understand what I'm talking about here. It's very challenging to design and manufacture a holster in such a way that you can have that big opening for a, a, a Streamlight TLR1, a Surefire X300, you know, that sort of thing to actually pass through and still protect the trigger. There's still, I mean, if you look at it, there's still a little bit of a gap in here, but there, there's only so much you can do. Now, here, here's the thing that is really smart about what they do with this particular design. As you see, this part of the holster here really comes up quite a ways onto the gun. And where we see companies that make light bearing holsters make a mistake in this regard, they they'll trim that a little bit lower and from the top especially it exposes quite a bit of the trigger and trigger guard and so it's, it's little things like that that sometimes people don't even know what to look for um and, and even then you know like again you can only do so much light bearing holsters but you know this one here yeah you see a little bit of gap there but it goes so much so high up above and straight in front of the trigger guard that you know, it's it's doing everything you can reasonably do and still protect the trigger in such a way. And I'm I'm perfectly comfortable carrying this one, or I wouldn't. You know, there's a comment from Stan asking how big of a problem is this. And he doesn't hear anything about this being a problem. I see problems like this on a regular basis, where I see holster designs that um, that lack in terms of safety. Uh, sometimes it's the trigger guard coverage issue like we're talking about here, but sometimes, but a lot of times it's, there's issues, other issues we're going to talk about here today and these other rules for holsters, um, that, uh, you know, I run into fairly frequently. The trigger well, guard think, one's a big deal. I think Stan, like the other, th the other thing to remember here is that we have a, a core gun safety rule about where we point the gun, about managing muzzle direction, you know, whatever version of that rule that you're familiar with. And a key to being compliant with that safety rule, and I think all of us agree that it's important, a key to being compliant with that safety rule is acknowledging that when a gun is in a proper holster that meets these rules, the gun is not pointed anymore. Like muzzle direction is no longer an issue or concern. And so if, if you are not, if you don't have a holster that meets this criteria, this minimum safety uh, criteria, then you, you really can't, manage the gun on and off your body all the time safely mm -hmm. that's right i've yet to see a right. carry position i mean for, a, uh, for for an iwb holster where that gun doesn't point at the body at some point right i mean my, 
I just pulled this off my body. This, this, my gun here is loaded. That's why it's going to completely remain in this holster throughout the rest of this episode here. Cause I wanted to, you know, just show a couple of things real quick. Um, but, but as long as it remains in the holster, like it is right now, this is not pointing at anything. It's not muzzling anything. It's not unsafe because it's a quality holster that's protecting the gun, protecting the trigger, making it so this thing is incapable of being fired while it remains in the holster. And that's a good point. You know, in fact, I've talked in the past on the podcast about one strategy for how to safely uh, and administratively handle yourself day to day, you know, kind of living that EDC lifestyle, if you will, of gunning up, gunning down every day. If you're, you know, carrying your guns regularly is to consider having your gun placed in the holster and then putting it on yourself. And it doesn't work always with all holsters or holster designs or types, but that's one thing I do. You know, you get up in the morning and throw my gun in the holster. Sometimes the gun may stay in the holster in the safe even, but you know, the gun goes in the holster and then I strap this on. So I'm, it's one less chance in an EDC lifestyle where literally every day I strap a gun on my body somewhere. I'm removing opportunities for, me to make a mistake somewhere because yeah. when I'm handling the gun, holst you know, putting the gun on my body, clipping it onto my belt, whatever it's contained in, in the holster itself. And that's, that's a good practice. The third component of this rule, just, I want to make sure we don't forget is the material that's covering the trigger guard. So when we verbalize it to say that the holster must fully cover the trigger guard in such a way, so as made the depression of the trigger impossible, that 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 making it impossible for the trigger to press is first achieved by covering the trigger guard as we've described. The second, it's achieved by covering it with a material strong, stiff, or solid enough to prevent something from penetrating through the holster, such that it could depress the trigger. So, mm -hmm. the most common way, for sure, the most common way I see rule number one be broken is with holsters made out of materials that are too soft. Think apparel holsters, you know, the tactical whatever undershirt or the leggings thingy or the fancy jeans pocket that break away, whatever. Like the, the vast majority of apparel holsters are inherently designed with pockets uh, where the material is extremely soft and mm -hmm. flexible. And if I can push my finger through the holster and press the trigger while it's in the holster, I'd call that a pretty significant problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is a big, big issue and one that people need to be aware of. Um, I, you know, and I'm of the opinion now where I, cause I think, I do think that you can manage some of those things. Um, some, some companies like that make the apparel holsters, like the, um, you know, pants or whatever that have a built-in holster pocket or whatnot. And they might recommend, well, put a credit card or something, you know, on the outside of the gun. And, and basically it's inside the pocket with that card basically blocking the, the trigger. And it's like, okay, well, all right. I guess that technically could protect the trigger, um, at least from one side. But why not just make something in the first place that actually properly protects the trigger? It's kind of one question I would ask. The easy thing in today's world, and, and the, the options, there's a, there's a plethora of them. There's so many great holster options out there that in my my personal opinion these days is why not just get a decent Kydex or Bolteron? Bolteron's a very similar, it's basically like Kydex. Why not just get something like this? You know, and I know that the response would be, well, you know, based on how I carry and my experience carrying there, that... XYZ holster or type of holster is not comfortable enough for me. And, and you know, that's, that's something that we all have to balance and we all have to figure out for ourselves. We have to, we have to manage comfort of carrying a gun with safety in carrying that gun and safety should override comfort. You know, not, I mean, safe. The thing is, is that we can't, we can, we can live without comfort. Okay. Like I can, I can choose to carry in a manner that is truly not comfortable at all, but we can never give up on the side of safety in my personal opinion. Yeah. I think the challenge comes where safety becomes a less of like a, a check bar check mark, like solid line that you, you achieve or don't achieve. And sometimes it feels a little bit more gray. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, people have to, to make big boy decisions or, you know, and figure that out and answer that, that hard question, but safety can't, it, it has to be a deal breaker. That is absolutely true. I, what I see a lot of Riley, I wanted to comment on the apparel holster thing is what I see a lot of people do these days is they'll combine a pocket holster mm-hmm. with an apparel holster, right? So they'll go buy a pocket holster that meets all the criteria we're discussing and then shove that into the pocket uh, of said apparel holster or other, you know, fancy weird product that, you know, maybe not as an apparel holster specifically. And so they're using the pocket holster to kind of achieve a lot of those objectives. And then they're using some other carrier, uh, a piece of apparel or bag or something else to you know, meet the convenience factor or positioning factor, whatever other thing they want. Now, whether or not that's going to meet all the four rules that we're going to discuss today is yet to be seen. Sure. I, for, for those who are newbies, I think most of our listeners, this, this, this is preaching to the choir. But for those of you who are newbies, the reason rule number one is so critical, the reason rule number one has got to be a complete deal breaker, is 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 un, is is really rooted in the understanding, the reality, the fact that modern handguns, gun was made in the last forty years, okay, modern handguns do not discharge unless the trigger moves rearward. Ooh. If the trigger doesn't move, gun doesn't fire. That's just the way they're designed with, with, with significant and serious and well-tested and proven safety things that you can't see, disable, turn off, or remove from the gun that are often are generally internal that, that make that so. So understanding at the root of the thing that the gun won't discharge unless the trigger moves tells you that the only thing you need to do to ensure the gun doesn't discharge is protect that trigger. Yeah. You know, I think it's relevant at this point to recognize the fact that over time things change and have changed. Uh, and I suspect that there's still some influence out there in the so-called industry where people are still kind of holding on to the way things used to be done. And just to kind of give you some perspective, realize that at one point, it was completely acceptable and not that long ago either, like even in the seventies uh, and perhaps even into the early eighties for, to, to a point, there was a point where law, it was acceptable for law enforcement officers, like the holsters they carried their revolvers in didn't even cover the trigger guard. Oh, you're, you're being generous the, you know, it wasn't that long ago that it was deemed entirely acceptable to just chuck a revolver in your pocket. Oh, sure. Without any holster at all. And, and I was going to, yeah, and I was going to allude to that as well, that, that guys will be like, well, I'll just throw my gun in my pocket or whatever. You know, it's, I've been doing that for 40 years. Well, okay. In the case of, uh, by the way, I'm not saying that's okay or any, any of what I'm about to say is okay, but realize that the context was at one time carrying a revolver with an exposed trigger guard was the norm in many law enforcement circles. Now, some of that carried over from when the revolver was a single action, meaning the trigger didn't do anything unless the hammer was pulled back. So like that carried over for a long time. Okay. And then they started making double action revolvers and carrying more of those, but still the holsters didn't quite catch up or evolve along with the guns as they probably should have. And then you get to a place where virtually all of your guns at one point in America either had a long, horrible, nasty, stiff trigger and or they had manual safeties that you had, you know, active safeties you had to manually engage or disengage on the gun, okay? Bring in the advent of what we would call the modern striker-fired pistol. Thank you, Glock, for, you know, for really making that the norm and that's most of what people carry these days and the so the triggers are different the triggers are lighter and are better than guns of yesteryear you've got a Keltec pistol jacob that is what i would consider is that was kind of more the norm 30 years ago yeah that was P9. It, yeah with you know just a nasty long gritty Brutal. double action trigger that was like 16 pounds or something ridiculous. And so th- I'm just creating some perspective that that's why I think people were okay or more okay with, well, just chuck it in your pocket because it would take quite a bit of effort and a whole lot of things to go wrong, meaning the right thing hitting in or 
the you know the wrong thing hitting in just the wrong place at the wrong time and with enough force to actually depress that one inch long travel 16 pound double action trigger and so people like that was an accepted practice but it isn't any longer and that's the, that's what i want to make clear but i think that we sometimes see so, uh, uh, you know, kind of some of these older ways of doing things kind of still hanging around a little bit, you know, that, that all kind of fades out a little bit slowly over time. There's still a little bit of influence and where we are today, again, we have the materials, we have the design capability, the machining capability, uh, the knowledge, and also the guns that, that make it necessary. But we have all of that to make it possible to, in my opinion, not, um, not compromise on safety as it relates to the holster you carry your gun in. All right. I've said enough about that. Rule number two. Yep. Rule number two, the holster must retain the firearm in the holster in such a way so as to only allow the firearm to exit the holster when the user intends it to. Yep. So this is about firearm retention to the holster. So I've got my floodlight here with my P320 in it, shaking it. Lightly, I appreciate that. So, no, I'm, no, I'm giving it a little good, jiggle. I'm going to be yeah. careful with it. Obviously, if I if I just you know really shake it, it'll fly out. It'll come out, yeah. But we have to put in context of it's got it's got a fair amount of retention that's acceptable for this purpose. Um, that when it's inside the waistband, compressed further by my belt, and in a more proper up and down orientation, it's an acceptable level of of retention. And so I use that as an example of like, that's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Probably, I mean, more retention is arguably better um, in that it's nice if your gun never comes out of the holster, unless you truly intend it to. But uh, you know, then we start getting into the realm of like retention duty holsters. Cause that's, those are truly the only holsters that probably actually meet that, that criteria sure. right yeah. where you have actual retention mechanisms that are deactivated by the press of a thumb or a finger or some you know and sometimes multiple steps so, you know pushing forward a hood out of the way and then having to push another lever down or in or back to actually release the gun from the holster and so in the context of most of us concealed carriers edc you know folks whatever you need to have some measure of retention <laughs> that means in the course of normal everyday life and i would consider you know you're walking around you're running around you're bending over you're picking stuff up you're doing work whatever like the gun shouldn't fall out of the holster period yeah i have uh two tests so i have first the oh but I'll, i always tell the joke this way just for fun if you're an fbi agent you should be able to do a backflip at the nightclub and not have your gun fall out and hit the ground <laughs> <laughs> like there's there's a like there's a consideration of the standard we're talking about anyway so no here's here's my two legitimate tests because i can't do backflips anymore um <laughs> my <laughs> my first test is what i call the jumping jack test so and, and you know ideally when, when this is an untested holster right it's a new holster i don't know if it's going to pass the test or not i'm i'm clearing it and i'm shoving a barrel block in it it just you know it takes a gun from being potentially dangerous tool to making it an inert object. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I've I've you know safetyed the gun in such a way as to make it inert. So test number one, put it in the holster, put the holster on the body, and, and then I do the jumping jack test. You know about ten like really vigorous jumping jacks. I would do more than ten if I thought I could, but I get winded. So about ten like really <laughs> vigorous jumping jacks, and I'm I'm feeling and listening because depending on the holster, you might be able to hear it. I'm I'm looking for the to see if the gun's going to vertically like come out of the holster at all. And 10 really strong serious vigorous jumping jacks probably going to going to be pretty indicative uh, of how that performs to that degree. So that's test number 1. Test number 2 is uh, basically what you just did on camera there a second ago Riley but for those who weren't watching I will stand over my bed so I have a soft surface underneath me. Again, gun is barrel blocked. Don't have to worry about it. You know, it's an inert object at this point. And I just jiggle it upside down. I just hold the holster in my hand and jiggle it upside down to see if the gun will fall out. And, uh, it, you know, I, I mean, obviously to your point, like if I really like gave it a, a solid, like, you know, 
wham, like if I just brought the gun down as fast as I could and then froze real fast, I, I expect it to come out. Um, but I'm looking for just, you know, some good jiggle, you know, think of it like a, like a, a pretty heavy jello jiggle. You know, I'm just trying to see if that gun's going to fall out and hit my bed or not. So those, you know, might sound yeah. completely ridiculous. Re recommend, recommend do it, doing it unloaded. I just said triple check it's unloaded. I barrel block it. Just making sure. The gun making is an sure. inert object at this point. It is incapable of firing <laughs> yes. around. It's, it's no longer a gun. It is a metal toy yep. at yep. this point. I was just, I was just reiterating one more time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, and I would kind of do like a, like a, it, it, for me, it's like a test you do in stages. It's like, you know, first just turn the holster upside down and just make sure that, you know, see if the gun stays in under its own weight. Sure. All right. Because right away, if it just falls out, well, all right, there's no point in jiggling yeah. it. Tests. Right. So make sure it passes that test and then, all right, that looks good. And then, you know, just see, see what it'll take um, with, with an upside down kind of shake test. And, uh, and it, again, it's, it's sort of a subjective test because like, you know, how much upside down shaking is it going to take? Uh, but you know, there should be some measure of retention there and the more, the better, um, uh, to a point that as long as I can deploy the gun, uh, when I want to, like, obviously if I have so much retention that it hinders my ability to actually get the gun out of the holster, then that, that would be too much, you know? So, um, gotta be a reasonable amount of, of retention. And that's what we're talking about here. The gun, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, I'll go back and I, I, you know, I'll put myself on record here of the first gun I carried was in a, you know, one of those like uncle Mike's soft nylon holsters with the plastic clip that you can bend backwards. Um, you know, I was young and inexperienced and not knowledgeable and also poor. And it's like, you're at Walmart and you see, Oh, holsters. Oh, inside waistband holsters. Oh, okay. You $15. Know, like I, need, I need one of those. Yeah, exactly. $10. Like I need one of those, I, you know, cause I need to carry concealed inside the waistband. The next thing you know, I'm sporting an uncle Mike's sock holster. We'll call it a sock holster. And, uh, you know, and I, I used that for probably a year and I didn't dump it on the ground, but there was a time I came very close to that thing coming out of the holster while I was in a grocery store. And that scared the bejeebers out of me. There's just like, okay, that, cause that would have been bad. You know, it's in a public place, um, dumping a ground or a gun on the ground, you know, not never a good idea. And, and so that actually, I think that's probably what got me looking at other options like, oh, that was scary, not cool, time to look for something else. And so then I went on to a hybrid holster after that. And that brings up another issue that we're going to get to, I think, with our third rule, which I don't know if we're to that point just yet. But so my point is, is like some of the stuff I've learned from experience and like that's a terrible experience. That's an uncomfortable experience to be in a position where all of a sudden you realize, Oh, my gun has somehow slid up out of the holster and is like teetering over the edge of my belt about to plop to the ground. That's, That's why retention is important. Now well, last thought on rule number two, I'm sorry, go ahead, Riley. I, I was going to say that's the basic reason why it's important, but we do see instances where people need to use a gun in self-defense. And actually, Matthew and I just covered one today uh, in the Justify Saves where, uh, you know, there was a, an entangled fight on the ground and the guy draws a gun and is able to use it. That's the secondary reason why we want retention, reasonable amounts, you know, of retention with the holster because you might, your gun fight might look like that entangled fight. And you don't want your gun popping out while you're rolling around on the ground or wrestling or getting the crap kicked out of you before you're ready to deploy it if it gets to that point. Mm -hmm. I think it's just worth commenting that some holsters have adjustable retention. Sure. So if you you know buy a holster or you're testing at a holster that you own or are borrowing or testing or are in some return period and you're trying to decide if it meets this criteria. 
you know, you should check to see if you can adjust the retention. It might be by tightening a couple of screws or loosening a couple of screws. Uh, you can achieve the level of retention that is that is good for you. So that's mm-hmm. that's worth noting. Yep. It can create some design challenges for holster makers, but that's not relevant to this podcast. But to the end user, adjustable retention, I I would consider as a as a uh, you know it's a enhancing feature. It's a good desirable thing. feature, it's nice to have, because then you can adjust it to what you need, what you need to. In the case of this Filster holster, it's you got these two screws right down here, you know, for adjusting retention, and that's that's great. Um, and actually, this holster you talked about holsters that are designed as you know one holster fits many makes or whatever and that's actually this is an example of one it's actually one of the few examples i know of that does it well but part of the reason why it works is that the holster is based around the light and it's the light that actually fits the holster and retains within the holster and then the rest of the shell of the holster is more generic so that it'll fit multiple uh, models of guns and, and so you'll see the, the retention screws right down here close to the light so you tighten or loosen that so that you can achieve the retention on that light that's necessary to keep it in the in the holster. So, yes, re- adjustable retention, good idea. A lot of uh, even law enforcement holsters that even have like level two, level three retention. Uh, many of those will still have an adjustment screw somewhere because there's typically, with those holsters, there's typically a passive uh, retention feature mixed in with other, like I said, levers or hoods or things that are also locking the, the gun into the holster. So uh, make sure you're utilizing, if that's a feature that's available in your gun, make sure you're utilizing it. Because I've certainly seen people that ha- that basically their retention screw is not adjusted. It was like not tight at all. And so basically you, ha- again, you're, you're back to where you have a sock and a gun, except that your sock is plastic. And, and so you t- you tip it upside down and it just fall right out. So yeah, use that retention screw and tighten it down. Absolutely. Rule number three, the holster must be retained to the body or whatever carrying device when the gun is drawn. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, when I think about this rule, I'm immediately reminded of a, a video I saw last year uh, in Missouri, the video is from a ring doorbell camera. And the guy is out watering his grass, holding his hose, manually watering the grass, which tells you you got way too much spare time. (laughs) This is why sprinkler systems were invented. I mean, worst case scenario, use one of those dumb frog things. You know, leave it for 10 minutes and then come back. Anyway, he's out there watering the grass with the hose. And uh, we don't have any audio because it's a a doorbell cam. But uh, two two, rough looking dudes come up to him wearing hoodies. Uh, Some words are exchanged. The words that are exchanged cause the hose holding w- grass watering man to drop the hose and go for his gun, which he's carrying OWB in like a paddle style holster. And he draws the gun out and points it at these dudes. And these are what we refer to as smart criminals. Smart criminals run when they see a gun. And that's what these two gentlemen do. They just bolt in, t- in different directions. Just boop, they're gone. And I don't know, a good solid 15 seconds later, this gentleman, the hose holding grass watering man realizes that the holster is still on his gun. He's holding a holster, pointing it at these hoodlums with a holster on it. Now that that's a pretty serious problem. You know, if these had been less smart criminals and they decided to charge, grab, fight, punch, kick, stab, shoot back, um, it probably would not have gone well. This guy probably would not have figured out very quickly that, Oh, the reason I can't shoot this gun is because I still have a holster on it. So mm-hmm. that's rule number three. When I draw the gun, holster doesn't come with it. Um, I've never seen something that egregious, but I have been on a firing line before where someone draws a gun and the holster comes off the pant sufficient enough that it like falls onto the ground in front of the firing line. That's a pretty embarrassing mistake too. I've absolutely seen people draw holsters in classes and, and have the whole holster come out. Uh, in fact, uh, you and I were talking before we went live with the podcast that uh, talking about the concealed carry instructor development course that I attended that uh, Jeff Gonzalez teaches at uh, Trident Concepts that I had the privilege of doing um, like a year and a half or so ago. Great class, you know, and, and he covered concealed carry related issues and especially talking about holsters very, very well. And right in that class, uh, there was a gentleman that uh, 
had his holster come out with the gun multiple times uh, throughout the course. I kept wanting to like get a photo or a video of it happening because I wanted to like document, like see it happens because like I, I will mention it to people and like, they don't believe me. And and uh, it's a failure of the of the equipment of the holster and, and particularly the mounting solution. And so, and I'll tell you spe specifically in, in this gentleman's case, his holster is, was using what is referred to as a foamy clip. Uh, and the foamy clip is a, is the like most ubiquitous, most common clip in, in used in holster making land, uh, which is probably the thing that frustrates me so much about it. Cause I've seen them fail so often. Uh, they, they, they break sometimes where the clip just flat out breaks. Um, but my bigger concern because i've seen it like i said numerous times is that they will pop off the belt pop off the pants and and then you're standing there uh watering your yard and holding your gun holstered pointing it at bad guys so um so when we talk about this third rule that the holster not only has to hold the gun in the holster but the holster has to stay retained to you uh that that is really important and it requires an evaluation of the equipment that actually mounts the holster to you. Uh, so what I've seen just in my experience is that plastic clips of any type generally don't hold up as well as we'd like them to. There are some that are better than others, but again, there are other way better options in today's world. So it's like, why would I, why use a plastic clip of any kind when I know there's a chance for that to fail? Well, so you can buy it after market. You can, you know, if, if mm -hmm. the holster you are obsessed with has plastic mm -hmm. clips, that doesn't mean you have to replace the holster necessarily. Mm -hmm. If it meets all the other criteria, you can buy aftermarket, you know, higher quality uh, clips. Yep. Yep. Um, just to give folks some ideas of, of what I think is preferable. Um, soft loops of some kind, I think are always, I mean, these, these things are known to work and to work very well. Part of the reason why is they have what's called a pull the dot button on them and it's a, it's a directional button. So it I would call it snap directional or snap. snap. Sure. Button snap. Whatever. Better word for those yeah. who don't have a visual. And, yeah. And so it requires that you only pull it and it's typically from the top down. It's actually difficult to do it. And not, I have one here that's not mounted to a holster. There we go. Got it to pop. I mean, you can see that's kind of how difficult it is to actually release that snap. And but it's directional, and and, and the re, and the fact that it's directional means that they're far less likely to pop loose. And uh, the, these are these are a great solution for mounting holsters to a belt. Um, what I've really grown a liking, a very strong liking to, is what is referred to these days as, as DCC clips and DCC is actually a brand. And this I just don't see game. anybody, I just don't see anybody else um, making or offering anything that is as effective as these clips. So you can look up D DCC clips. It stands for discrete carry concepts. That's the company name. They have like 15 different clip options, both in terms of different widths, different heights, different lengths, different mounting holes in the clip themselves that, you know, some are can't adjustable, some are not, some are adjustable for height, some are not, but they all share the fact that they're made from a very strong spring steel that just takes an incredible amount of strength to actually deform and make ineffective. And then they have a little return piece, a hook on the bottom of the clip that just always ensures that it it hooks onto and, and and retains itself onto the belt. They don't pop off on their own, um, and and they also have clip options that will absolutely clip directly to pants. And because those clips are so effective at hanging on to stuff, they, like you can just clip them onto the pants and and they will retain. Um, you know, for a while there, I, I I was you know liking the Ulti clips because they basically accomplished this same thing sort i mean in a different way but they they allowed some of the same flexibility of use uh, but i have seen the ulti clips over time the the hinge starts springing open a little bit and they can pop loose and, and and fail on you but the fact is he's he's relatively new to the market i mean they're like just a couple years old and and really are just coming onto the scene in the last year or two um they just i've not seen anything else that works as well as they do I bring that up because it's relevant because, again, I mentioned how I went to a hybrid holster after I used my sock holster, and uh, that holster retained the gun 
inside the holster a lot better than my sock holster did. But one day I was actually in a Sam's club and I'm just doing my thing. And I realized that my gun and holster was hanging out of my pants almost like it was like, it, again, remember the story of my gun, like teetering on the brink of like about to fall out of my pants and onto the floor. This was like that, but the gun was still in the holster. And what it was, was the rear clip is it was a two clip deal. It had popped loose and the holster had ridden its way up. It, the front clip was still there, but it, it wouldn't have mattered because if that kept right, you know, riding up, it was just going to get over to the edge and flop out. And then, and then the gun most likely would have flopped out as well. So that sort of was the end of my hybrid holster days too. Um, and I've seen that happen multiple times because those, what happens is those hybrid designs that have the two clips, one on each side of the holster, the rear one is a little bit more vulnerable to, it gets tweaked a little bit more as you're, as you move and your back moves and, and the back part of the pants and the belt kind of tweak and, and, and twist and stuff like that. And then also it's more, uh, uh, they're more vulnerable to like, as you get in and out of your vehicle or you sit down in a chair of just catching things back there behind your back a little bit and popping loose. So, um, so that, that kind of, again, was like the next evolution for me of, well, I don't like that because as soon as I have a failure of any kind, it's like, well, clearly that can happen again. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to take that chance because again, I take carrying the act of a gun very seriously. I don't want to have any failures. Yeah. So I have three clip criteria. It's going to sound like overly crazy and detailed, but the clip should do the following three things. First, we have a question of quantity. Two clips is better than one. And so well, I think we see a lot of the higher quality manufacturers today putting two smaller clips on the holster so that you have double the odds of retaining the holster to the body. Uh, better than one. We have the hook, you know, the thing that comes under, you know, underneath that that prevents, you know, the the clip from coming off unless you manually really, you know, yank it off. And we see lots of different values of those hooks. The, the those traditional like foamy clips, like ones you're talking about, the ones that were on the hybrid holster you're referring to. The the hook is not really a hook at all. It's more like just a, a little rounded, little kind of you know back back section, which works really great for like my flashlight that I got on my pants right now. That's fantastic, but not so often for a holster. And we see those all tons of clips just have this rounded. You know, I, I use the word hook, but it's not even really a hook at that point. It's just some, some rounded, you know, shape that, I mean, it takes very little amount of pressure to just yank. It will, it's designed to slide off. That's why it's rounded. Yeah. Um, so compare that to like a real true, like back hook. Sometimes it's just a flat uh, hook, which is better than nothing. Sometimes it's actually a, a back but upward angled hook, like the ones you're referring to on, on your holster right now. That thing is aggressive. I mean, it's mean. So it's not coming off. So we have two is better than one. The hook, it being as aggressive, more aggressive is better, and certainly rounded is unacceptable in my world. And the third issue is size relative to the belt. So if you have a one and a half inch uh, on your clip, on your clip, on your belt clip, but you're running a one inch belt, you're going to have a harder time. Retention is not going to be as good as if those two dimensions matched. So two inch, you know, if you, maybe you have a one and a half inch belt, which is a pretty standard, you know, nylon gun belt, but you're running a two inch, uh, uh, you know, belt clip on your holster. Not as awesome. Uh, and then the last thing I'll add that I think affects retention and I'll, and I'll throw it back. Cause I know you have another comment, Riley is the belt itself. When we talk about ret retention, it's not just the holster. You can sometimes have a very, you know, holster that would otherwise meet these criteria and perform adequately but because you're wearing a crappy belt. It doesn't yep. retain well because the bolt can yep. belt can can roll. If you can hold the belt in your hand and then you and you can squeeze it such as to bend your belt in half, it's not going to retain the gun perfectly all the time. It, it, the holster it can slide off that thing with with limited amount of effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do see concealed carriers make that mistake where I see sometimes questions posted in a, posted in a group or something and like, hey, I'm having problems and and then they show their belt and it's like, well, there's your at least part of your problem. You know, uh, use a, a belt that's intended with the purpose of working with a holster and carrying a gun. Simple as that. 
Uh, Bob on Facebook asks, does anyone make a metal clip similar to the foamy clip? Um, yes, there are some out there that are similar to that. And I have tested some of them and I have had some of those fail as well. In fact, I had a holster there for a while that I, that I pretty well liked. And it used a clip that basically looks exactly like a foamy clip, but it's just made for metal. And it, it seemed like it had greater strength. Like, you know, it's, it's made from spring steel. Like it just seemed like it was pretty strong that way clipped on and held on pretty tight uh but then one day i was practicing draws and it came right off the belt and i was using a good belt that fit it um it's just that's the single clip thing it uh and the fact that the clip is wider in the case of those kind of foamy style clips uh i think there's more of a prevalence for leverage to exert some force that is able to pop those things loose um, and again, if, if it doesn't have, in a lot of cases, I feel that, that, that little return hook on the underside of the clip, like I've showed on these, uh, DCC clips, then, you know, we're, what I'm talking about is the clips where you basically just have bent metal and it kind of for, it sort of forms like a little ledge or a little hook like Jacob was talking about, but it's not a hook. It's just really just like a little ledge this is where, rounded. Yeah. where if all it is, is bent, it, it, it's not going to retain like it should compared to like these DCC clips I'm holding up where they're actually, what they're doing is they're bending the clip to get the shape, but then they're also cutting the metal and then bending that hook part in. And so you get that really aggressive hook that truly is a hook. It, it, it's like a fish hook. So well, like anyway. we put a foamy clip on the, on the range tech shot timers, which in the case of a shot yeah. timer, you know, that that's that's fine like we're not that concerned you know with with the retention of of the shot timer to your belt but um yep. anyway yeah yep and like i said like that that's a that rounded clip is what i have on this flashlight i'm carrying right now and in yep. the case of flashlight that's fine like i want to be able to one hand and just quickly grab it and slide it off my pocket but yep. i don't want that happening to my gun yep Let's get now to the fourth and final rule. Um, although I have a wild card I'm going to throw out at the very end. Um, the fourth rule, I believe, is that you should be able to get in. Jacob, will ha he has his specific wording that he uses. Uh, and, and I've kind of come away from the combat grip term. But, hey, you need to get a full and proper grip on the gun, a firing grip on the gun right from the draw. If you cannot do that, then your holster sucks. That's my yeah. rule. Yeah, no, that I mean, yeah, I, I would word it to the degree of your holster should position the gun con so that you can consistently get a full combat grip out of the out of the holster immediately on the draw. Yeah. So consistent is a key word here too, because like think about like an off body thing. So we'll see some people who you know they throw throw, throw the gun in a pocket holster, put that pocket holster in a dedicated pocket of their bag or purse or whatever, and it's like, well, that that pocket holster might have the capability of allowing for a, a combat grip, you know, that I, where you're, you know, a proper grip, whatever. I don't care what you want to call it, Riley. Mm -hmm. But, but if, if it's bouncing around then it's not always in the same spot in that pocket. So when I open the bag, when I open the pocket in that bag and I go for it, sometimes it's oriented one way, sometimes the other way. So it has to be, the holster has to present the gun such that it's consistently provides you with an immediate grip. And I, I tend to see three failures, three, three ways the holsters fail to meet this criteria. The first one I just expanded on, which is if, if it's bouncing around in a bag, you know, then that's, that's a problem, right? It's just not consistent in the same position every time. Um, the second way I see this fail is we'll see holster makers. This is often also a mistake of uh, one holster for many models. Other times it's just straight up design flaw, but we'll see the material of the holster itself come up underneath the trigger guard up above the trigger guard into the grip area of the gun. So when you go to achieve your grip, your fingers are running into the holster material. That shouldn't happen. I mean, the fingers that go around the grip, that should not, that should not happen. And the third way we, we see failures most often with this rule is we'll see the holster position the gun too deep in the pants to the degree that the grip of the gun is sitting against the pants or the, or the pant line, the belt, so that I can't, there's no room, there's no space for me to get my fingers between the pant and the gun. You know, this effectively means I got to grab the gun and, and remove it an inch or so from the holster in order to then start to acquire my grip from, from the holster. Sometimes that's adjustable. Sometimes you can adjust the height 
uh, the, a holster sits in the pants. Sometimes you cannot. Uh, and sometimes the holster material itself sits right there. In the case of like mm -hmm. a lot of belly bands, uh, things like that. Um, I guess I could think of a fourth one as long as I'm on a roll, then I'll, I'll toss it to you, Riley. But the fourth way we'll see, and I guess it's kind of the second one I mentioned, but we'll see the sweat guard as an issue. Mm -hmm. So when, when I said the holster material comes up too high above the trigger guard, sometimes it's just the sweat guard in its entirety. You know, the whole sweat guard is just in the way. It just impedes your hands from getting into the right place. And sometimes we'll see holster makers who, oh, you can get our combat cut. You know, we we cut this holster in just the, such the way that the material will not impede said draw. Sometimes that's done very well. Sometimes even then it still is impeding, you know, acquiring the grip. So so that's what we mean by the rule. And those are the four ways I most often see the rule uh, broken or a holster fail to meet that criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, agree with all of that, and, and that is, yeah, so so is true. What are we talking about here as it relates to the draw and the grip? When you have holster material impinging upon where your middle finger, right? Because your middle finger needs to go, you know, here I just have a grip module of a 320. Your middle finger needs to go right in here, right? Right below the trigger guard. Immediately below the trigger guard, yeah. Right in front of the grip, and you'll see... A, not good, a good number of holster designs out there where holster material is basically in that space or occupying that space. Or, as you mentioned, sweat guard material that is occupying the space where the web of your hand and your thumb needs to go. And so what it results in is shooters trying to draw and they end up having to kind of pinch the gun in the web of their hand until they can get it out of the holster and then they can finish and complete their grip. Well, if you're having to, if you can't just grip the gun like you like you would to shoot the gun right from the draw, and you're having to fix it on the way, you're costing yourself time, efficiency. You're more likely to fumble the draw and fumble yeah. the gun and drop the gun. Issue. You're gonna have way more issues and, and way higher risk of doing stuff like that if you are in some kind of entangled fight, because now you got hands and fists and things flying around, and you're entangled, and everything is messy and and stressful like you need to if you're gonna if 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 you've made the decision that it's time to go to the gun draw the gun use the gun you want to get positive contact and grip on that gun just the same way that you're going to fire the gun that's why i call it, it's a firing grip it, that's all it is because a firing grip is what you should get on the draw because you shouldn't have to change a dang thing about that firing hand on the gun from the time it touches it in the holster to the time you're up on target. That's, that's, that's my requirement. If you, if your holster does not permit that to occur, you need to get a new holster. I don't care that this one, this other one is more comfortable or that it works for you. Um, just know that you are handicapping yourself. If you can't actually draw and use your gun, like you're supposed to just, just think of it in that way. Yeah. And, and <laughs> We run it. We run into students who will say something like, "No, well, it's never been an issue for me." Well, then you've never tried to draw fast, ever, and yep. and without question, getting to target quickly is huge. It's a big deal. We've talked about that plenty of times, and maybe we'll have another episode about it in the future. Yep. But getting to target quickly matters. And if you think that, "Oh no, adjusting my grip as I draw is fine. It, it's working for me," then you you are not meeting the standards that we think are our minimum standards to get the gun into the fight. Yep. And and you've not been in a context where you've been tested to the degree to find out that you're not meeting those standards. That's right. That's right. And the time to find that kind of stuff out is not in the middle of the fight. No. Uh, I feel like a total dunce right now because Bob is clearly looking at discrete carry concepts website. And he says, looks like the DCC mono block clip might be a good replacement for the foamy for me. And I feel like a doofus because I knew that I, I just spaced it in the moment that uh, DCC absolutely makes a product called the monoblock clip. And it is, it is actually intended to replace foamy clips. It, 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 it mounts the same way as a foamy clip, but it applies the principles of how these DCC clips work and will absolutely clip onto your belt and your pants uh, securely, unlike the foamy clip. So, yes. Awesome, Bob. I'm glad you discovered the monoblock, and I should have remembered that well enough to mention that earlier. I have a monoblock. 
on a Filster Pro holster. Holster, in fact. Yeah, I, I'm running the mono block on uh, on my one of my KSG Armory holsters. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so, you were showing me that the other day. Yeah. So, um, here's my wild card. I just thought I'd throw out there. Um, oh, hold on, hold on. Hold oh, go, okay. I guess I just I wanted to like clarify something here. We often in this podcast talk about like this is a journey, and you mm -hmm. got to start where you start and where you end. And of these initial four rules we've mentioned, I just wanted to to make clear: the first two are legitimate safety concerns. And, and as such, you need to think of them as that that level of deal breaker, deal breaker. Like they 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 make you unsafe. And so I would never ever uh, suggest it's okay for any any justifiable reason to carry a gun unsafe. The the second two rules that the holster should be retained to the body when you draw, and that the gun should be presented to you in such a way you can consistently get a firing grip on the gun out of the holster. Those are not uh, as much safety concerns other than you might die in the gunfight, but they're not they're not safety concerns relative to the actual just daily carrying of the gun. They're more more so uh, addressing your ability to to fight good, to, to gunfight properly and the holster maximizing your odds of being successful in the gunfight. okay? So I guess my my point in saying that, and Riley, you might disagree with me. While I think of all four of those rules as deal breakers, for me personally, if a person was was using a holster that met rule number one and number two, but not three and or four, I think they're still better off having the gun with them than leaving it home. I just don't think they're as prepared as they should be, and their holster is not as good as it should be. There's there's no reason for them to not have a holster that that that, that meets all four of these rules, but you've you've crossed off the safety concerns that I have. And while you're not going to be as successful in some gunfights, you straight up might fail and die. I'm, I'm comfortable with you having the gun in said holster as long as it is it, it meets rules number one and two. That's, that's my perspective on that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have, if, if you have safety issues, fix them. Um, otherwise, I mean, I, and I shared my part of my personal journey today in this episode, you know, sharing some of the uh, uh, mistakes that I've made in the past and what I've learned from that. And that's how I've ended up where I am today. Um, my hope is, though, that and one of the reasons why we do the podcast and put things out like this is to help some of you hopefully avoid some of those mistakes in the first place. I'd rather you not have to touch that stove, you know, uh, firsthand and go, oh, that's hot and my hands now melted. Um, I understand that some of you have to do things the hard way and that's okay, you know, but I, I hope that you don't have to and by us putting out hopefully good information. All right. My, uh, what I think could be put up as consideration for a potential rule five. And that is that, uh, and, and I would say, honestly, I'm at a place where I would say, yes, this should absolutely be included. Like it would be five rules for holsters in my world. Uh, I know that you teach the four rules that we've just discussed in your, your concealed carry classes, Jacob, um, I do the same thing, except I add this fifth component, uh, cause I think it's valid. And that is that the holster should enable you to reholster the gun in a safe manner. And by that, that generally means that the holster needs to retain its shape so that we can easily and safely just insert the gun into the holster as opposed to a holster that collapses that we then need to use you know two hands and we're, we're at risk of muzzling one of the hands as we're trying to like spread the opening the holster open uh to to insert the gun and, I, and that kind of thing can be done and i've done that very thing myself and done it i believe to be in a safe manner even but it just is an increased potential risk and again, in today's world with amazing, you know, a, a plethora of options, why handicap myself and or potentially increase risk uh, to myself when I can just simply choose a holster that retains, you know, its shape and its opening so that when I'm done, I just put it back in. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'll uh, completely sign off on rule number five or I'll pawn. I'll admit that for me, for a long time, rule number four was optional. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, sure. it took a while for me to come around to rule number four. And so now you've given me a fifth one to consider. I, I guess what I would yeah. just throw on to support your potential rule number five is that it, it is a training problem because mm -hmm. what we see is that someone will be using a holster and they'll say, well, it's fine for everyday carry because I don't need to reholster every day. But then when I go take a class from so-and-so or when I'm at the range doing a bunch of draw related practice or when I'm doing dry fire, I switch over to this other holster that enables me to be able to reholster all the time. Like to some degree, we have to come to grips that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not going to sign off on it for Jacob at this time. I'm going to ponder on that one more. Um, and I th definitely think you, had, you need to re revise the wording to make it more specific. It's pretty vague as it stands. But oh, no. there's, there's my two cents on rule number five. You know, when, we, when we're in a class and we're talking about it, you know, it's, it's – uh, and I appreciate that you have worded the four rules uh, very specifically um, because that's always good. Um, I've not, I mean, obviously if I just spent a little time thinking about it, we could word it very simply and in a manner that's very understandable, but in most contexts where I'm discussing this, it's like, I have holster and this is what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Like we can kind of point at it, talk about it, show it, demonstrate it. Um, here's a holster where that, you know, isn't the case, you know? So what we're looking for is this, not that kind of thing. But yeah, so um, there's many other things we could get into about holsters, but our time is up today. Uh, but but this is the bit; these are the big ones, and especially these four rules for holsters, as we call them. Uh, again, as Jacob, I think, very succinctly uh, summarized, two of them being absolutely very safety oriented, and that is that is the case. Like uh, we need to protect that trigger and trigger guard. We need to make sure the gun stays in the holster. I would say I would say there is a little bit of a safety component. I think even with Rule Three, uh, but less so. Um, and by that I mean like the time that my gun felt like it was falling, the holster and everything was falling out of the pants. See what I what I perceive could happen is that that could dump things onto the ground, and I might react and try to reach for it. So it's similar to a gun falling out of the holster. Um, so anyway, but I think you summarized it beautifully. Um, safety issues got to make sure those are not issues, and then making sure that your holster stays where it should stay uh, and that you can access your gun in an acceptable manner. You can get a proper grip because then why else are we carrying it? If we can't actually put the gun into the fight in the, in a moment's notice uh, like we need to, then why are we carrying it in the first place? At that point, it's a feel good thing. Yeah. I've got this thing strapped on my hip and I feel good that I have it with me. I don't know how to use it very well. I can't draw very well, but, I'm cool, bro, because I got my gun. Yep. My parting words will be something I've said many other times on this podcast and I feel very strongly about, which is aside from carrying the gun in a manner that is unsafe, you are better off with it than leaving it home. But it is a journey and you probably can improve on the current loadout and setup. All right. Amen to that. So with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I got, I hope you guys got something out of this episode today. I hope that you got some, some meat on the bone. You can kind of chew on and think over and evaluate your own personal gear and make adjustments where you think you need to make adjustments. Um, as Jacob said, we are all on a journey. Um, I, I anticipate that where I am now will be different than where I am two years from now. And probably not as drastically as where I was, say, five years ago. But, well, you know, I'll be in a different place as Jacob should be in a different place, as all of you should be in a different place. Because if we're on a journey and we're moving forward, that means hopefully we are growing and learning. And that means the journey will take us different places. So with that, we'll let you go. A reminder to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care.